very much for that introduction. Um, my name is Rachel um, and Rob is here with me as well. So I'm going to hand over to Rob. He's going to speak to you about the the first half of the presentation and I'm going to speak um, for the second half with respect to surgery and surgical management. So we hope that you enjoy the talk. Thank you. Hi. Uh, so we're going to start off with uh, just a, a quick overview um, looking at what we're going to talk about. So I'm going to cover the etiology, uh, diagnosis, staging and surgical planning of what we want to do with these cases and then Rachel's going to come in later talking about the actual surgery, the post-operative management and the adjunctive therapy and uh, following on with that with some monitoring and prognosis. So feline injection site sarcomas are subcutaneous tumours of mesenchymal uh, connective tissue origin. Clinical presentation is usually of soft tissue mass with a variable rate of growth at a common injection site and usually quite easily palpable. They usually occur around 67 years of age, which is a lot younger than non-injection site sarcomas, which tend to present in more geriatric cats at around about 11 years of age. Although a second peak in injection site sarcomas is also noted uh, around this time as well. Tumours uh, themselves are usually solid, raised, non-painful and often cystic. Uh, some you'll find will be mobile under the skin and others will be more firmly attached um, to those uh, underlying tissues. Um, these uh, tumours uh, often appear well circumscribed or, or, or even in, encapsulated, um, but despite their gross appearances they tend to have uh, poorly defined histological margins and often infiltrate through fascial planes in a highly aggressive and very locally invasive way. They've got these sort of long tentacles of of tumour which can often be seen extending from the edges of what appears to be the palpable mass and infiltrating into the surrounding subcutaneous soft tissue and muscle. Histologically they can have a very variable morphology and I put that up there on the slide um, a, a lot of different types of, of sarcomas that we can see um, but the fibrosarcoma is probably you know, by far the most common um, that we do see associated um, with, with vaccination. So in terms of the tumour behaviour, despite their variable morphology, they do all contain histological, certain histological features which are consistent across uh, all types of injection site sarcomas. They're characterised primarily by a prominent perilesional lymphocytic reaction and a large necrotic areas. The latter is often considered a criteria of malignancy in many histological grading systems and that may be why when we look at grading of injection site sarcomas they tend to be graded higher than other soft tissue sarcomas. However, they also tend to exhibit more malignant biological behaviour and other histological features such as marked nuclear and cellular pleomorphism, a high mitotic activity as well as increased tumour necrosis. So a little bit of history um, looking at actually where feline injection and psych sarcomas, so they, they haven't always been recognised and it's only been in the last 25 years that they've really come to light. Um, and its history is actually relatively interesting. Um, it started back in the United States uh, in 1979 um, when they, they noted the prevalence of feline rabies to be on the rise. Um, that was attributed to a, a small number of domestic cats being vaccinated um, and also at the time a large out outbreak of wildlife rabies. That led to an increase in post-exposure prophylaxis in human medicine after exposure to cats with suspected rabies. And in 1987, the state of Pennsylvania decided to act upon that and enacted a law requiring all cats to receive rabies vaccination. The public health concern was so great that this resulted in an increase in the subcutaneous rabies vaccination across the entirety of America. And at that time, the vaccines in use were all killed aluminium adjuvanted vaccines, which as you'll see why we come on to later, the links between al aluminium adjuvants and injection site sarcomas were first made. However, that said, it was dogs and not cats, whoever were first reported to show vaccine reactions. Um, and in 1988, nine cats were reported to develop local reactions several days after combined rhinotracheitis calcivirus vaccine. But it was a few years later, uh, again in Pennsylvania at the pathology lab, uh, where there was an identified an increase in the number of submitted biopsies of inflammatory, uh, inflammatory injection site reactions. 
So the pathologists there decided to look into these results a little closer and found that all these animals had been injected subcutaneously with rabies vaccine or a combination of rabies vaccine and other vaccines approximately two weeks to two months previously. One of the pathologists from that report, Hendrik, teamed up with Goldschmidt, another pathologist from the same institute, to work on that a bit further. And it was this team that in 1991 first recognized possible association between vaccination of cats and the development of fibrosarcomas at injection sites. It was over the next four to five years where multiple studies produced and reported strong evidence to support the suggestions made in Hendrick and Goldschmidt's original paper associating the administration of inactivated feline leukemia virus and rabies vaccines and the subsequent development of soft tissue sarcomas actual, uh, at vaccine sites. Similar reports also suggested associations with feline panleukopenia and feline ranitracheitis vaccine administration. The results of those epidemiological studies provided much of what we know today, although even now, 25 years on, work is still being carried out. The incidence of sarcoma development after vaccination is rare, and thus reports are somewhat variable due to relativistically low numbers of cases. However, reports suggest uh, that the incidence of development of feline injection site sarcoma is approximately 1 in 10,000 vaccinations, but may be as high as 1 in 1,000 vaccinations administered. The interval between vaccination and tumor development, though, has been reported to be between four weeks to 10 years, although times on average seem to be around 11 to 26 months. The effect of multiple injections appears to be additive, and the likelihood of sarcoma development increases with the number of vaccines given simultaneously at the same vaccine site. However, contrary to some of the early reports and theories, no single vaccine manufacturer or vaccine type, including the use of aluminium adjuvants, has a higher or lower association with the development of soft tissue sarcoma. In other words, it's not actually been possible to make an association between specific vaccines and tumor development. Additionally, vaccine practices such as needle gauge, syringe reuse, and the using multi-dose vials, uh, mixing vaccines in a single syringe, and a particular syringe type don't appear to have any role in development of tumors. Although only vaccines were initially implicated in, in sarcoma development, it has become apparent that any injected compound, such as a bit of, uh, you know, amoxile or Depomed, or even uh, absorbable suture material actually causing any sort of local inflammation, may actually play a role in oncogenesis and the subsequent development of what we now refer to as injection site sarcomas. The temperature of injections has also appeared to play a role in this as well. Many theories have been proposed for the etiopathogenesis of vaccine-associated sarcomas. However, the most popular theory is that vaccine-associated sarcomas arise from inappropriate or overzealous inflammation or immunologic reactions, or both, can associated uh, with the presence of vaccine components in vaccine sites. This reaction then leads to the uncontrolled proliferation of fibroblasts and myofibroblasts that in a certain subset of patients undergoes malignant transformation. The thought that inflammation precedes tumor development is supported by histologic identification of zones of transmission from inflammation to sarcoma and microscopic foci of sarcoma located in areas of granulomatous inflammation. A similar phenomenon is recognized with feline intraocular sarcoma, which develops after ocular trauma or chronic uveitis. And this demonstrates a common pathogenesis of inflammation in the development of soft tissue sarcomas in cats. This relationship between trauma and inflammation and recovery in the cat is unique and not yet fully understood. Whilst we're here, it's worth mentioning that uh, feline um, leukemia virus and feline sarcoma virus do not appear to have a role in the development and pathogenesis of feline injection site sarcomas as once thought, but growth factors do. Papers continue to link growth factors with development of injection site sarcomas in cats. Growth factors regulate the cellular events involved in granulation tissue formation and wound healing. And when these factors are added to fibroblast cultures, the cells develop a neoplastic phenotype. Platelet-derived growth factor, epidermal growth factor, transforming growth factor beta and their respective receptors have all been linked to injection site sarcomas by immunoreactivity testing. It's been hypothesized that lymphocytes, which appear in response to inflammation caused by a subcutaneous injection, secrete platelet-derived growth factor. 
This in turn recruits macrophages and causes fibroblast proliferation and subsequent neoplastic transformation. Increased growth factor stimulation by fibroblasts 